92. The Lord is in his holy temple. Kneel for prayer, please. <clears throat> Father in heaven, what a privilege to be able to come into the house of worship, knowing that we have a hands-on God who loves us with every beat of his heart. We're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, and the price that he paid upon the cross, Father, that we may have eternal life and the blessings that we do have here uh, on earth. We invite the Holy Spirit to come and fill this place today, Lord, that we may better understand your word, love one another more strongly, and be able to leave here today with a, a gladdened heart. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing our opening hymn. I know whom I have believed. Hymn number 511. I know whom I have believed. Thank you. 
You may be seated. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. The offerings and for this uh, Sabbath is going to be for local church budget. Enthusiasm for God's work. Several years ago, a pastor came to a church that was heavily in debt over a building program. What to do? The church was barely meeting its monthly mortgage payment to the conference revolving fund, and some months not meeting it at all. Watch now what happened and how the dynamics changed. An Adventist financial consultant was contacted to help to get over this hump, and he required further expenditures to get the campaign going, several thousands of dollars. Will the church buy into this plan? Well, think of this now from a business standpoint. Business people know that you must spend money in order to make money. A brand new business cannot make even its first dollar until there is expenditure for office space, furniture and equipment, advertising, raw materials, and such. Sometimes a church needs to think like business. The pastor has to sell the idea to the church that expenditure of 40,000 will be needed in order to pay off the debt of nearly 800,000. He posed a question to the church board and later the church in business sessions. Will you spend $40 to make a hundred? Of course, proportionally, that's what will be taking place. The church voted to go ahead and with God's blessing, the debt was entirely paid off in five years. But that is not the best part. During those five years, tithes and offerings for all the other funds were up as well. How do you explain it? Enthusiasm for God's work. Now, deacons, please come forward. and we will be praying. Father in heaven, our creator, dear Jesus, we come into your presence to lay our burden, to lay our heart to you, to surrender completely the Lord into your hands, and that your will will be done on our lives, Father in heaven. We surrender always our financial situations in you, dear Lord, that we can come boldly to you, and that you can use it, dear Lord, to express the gospel. So we all together soon can see you return and be in heaven with you. Bless this offerings, dear Lord, and bless the building, and bless all, dear Lord, the members that are here present and the ones that know them present. And that you message the Lord, the good news of Jesus can be spread. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
please stand as we sing the doxology. may be seated. Happy Sabbath to all. Good to see you. Nice weather, huh? It's a nice day to be out. We deserve this, right? We've had a winter. We have some prayer requests today and praise requests. Uh, this is from Bill George, and this is a, a praise of sorts. Uh, wish Karen George a happy and blessed birthday. Happy birthday to you. Where's she at? She must have known. She's in the kitchen. Yeah, get in the kitchen. All right. Erica, prayer. Please, please pray for my children and husband and also that we can be effective next Sunday at the fair to bring youth and more young adults to know Christ. That's what it's all about, right? Jeremy Watson for David Leslie. Pray for the family of David who died Thursday from complications of Agent Orange from Vietnam. David was my life long friend. Sorry to hear. Michael and Renee Warwick, uh, medical for Max Warwick. Mike's uncle Max had to have a triple bypass on Tuesday uh, of this week. He also has a large blockage in his jugular vein which is inoperable. Please pray for healing, indeed. Tasha Warwick, Betty McCormick, please continue to pray for healing for, my, for me, Ma, Betty McCormick, as she recovers from her shoulder surgery. A lot of medical stuff. Renee Warwick, Wendy Thomas, please pray for my sister-in-law. She is having abdominal surgery on Monday. And uh, Freeman Grote is asking for prayer for himself. I need prayer for healing. Uh, he's having problems uh, with balance and walking and arthritis. It's tough. Uh, as far as possible, please kneel for this prayer. And you know the lives of the people that are affected by the, both the medical um, medical problems that are listed in the, on these, um, these sheets. And, but there's a lot of families and friends that are, come along with that. We, um, we pray for them, dear Father. Comfort them, give them courage. May they seek you in faith. May they seek you in surrender. May they seek your guidance. We can't always know. In fact, we don't know what the future holds. And many times we watch by helplessly as others suffer that we love or care for. Um, and we look for answers. Uh, I pray that the answers will be given. Sometimes it's just grace. Sometimes it's God's plan. Sometimes it's for the best. We don't always know. But we know that you love us. You died for us. And no matter what happens in this world, you're there. If we just seek you. You're there with a free gift of salvation and an unparalleled love relationship. We thank you for the praises of those listed. There's also good things in life and things that we can celebrate. It is a beautiful world, and we hope that we all enjoy it and take the time to enjoy it. And may we also encourage others as we go throughout our life, um, lifting up others, being encouraging to others as we see them, because all of us are going through this journey, and sometimes it is very difficult. Thank you, dear Lord, for all you've done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> It's time now for the children's story. And Virginia Taylor is our storyteller today. And we'll have the children's offering along with that. It's story time.
Good girl. All right. So we're out of little ones. So you guys go ahead. Be the disciples. Go pick up. Come on. In the back behind you. Amen. They want to give to the Lord. Take it. Bring it in. All the way in the back. Keep waving them. She's coming. Amen. Amen. That's all you guys today. Wasn't it neat that I talked to you beforehand? All right. Amen. Oh, she's still picking up. Very good. Oh, Gon's got it. All right. You guys can just sit right here on the bench. Perfect. Amen. Well, you guys have not seen me before. Well, you've seen my face, but I'm Sister Taylor, and um, I am going to do something really cool with you guys. This young lady's the only one who's not privy to what we're going to do so far. So, do you guys know what an ambassador is? Well, let's tell everybody else. An ambassador is someone, this is layman's terms, do not go to the dictionary. Somebody who knows, knows a whole lot of stuff about something or someone. That means that they're going to be the best representative of that thing. So an ambassador of a country, right? Or an ambassador of someone who's in a prestigious position. They know a whole lot. Well, what do you do to get to be an ambassador? You probably need to be in training, right? of some type, so kind of like if I was an ambassador for Christ, then if I come down a level, I would need to be a disciple before that, right? So a disciple is what? Uh, a follower. Yes, a disciple is a follower, someone who follows. So if you think about us nowadays, who who follows? A follower is somebody who learns, right? So if you're learning something, where do you guys learn something? School. So what are you? Students. Students. I whispered that one to them. <laughs> so students are in training to become disciples or better at what you do. So for Christ, we are students of the word and we're becoming disciples, so we're students in training. So if we want to become an ambassador for God, then we're disciples in training. So we're going to do something right now. Is it a training session? Ready? Are you ready? Yes, yes, OK. Tasha is going to take a hold of this bowl right here, and she's going to stand up. Come here, Tasha. All right, we're not going to take long doing this, but we've got a whole bunch of you, so we're going to employ all these guys. OK, so stand up, guys. We've got five of them here. In this bowl, everybody grab a handful. We have stones. Stones. What does the word of God say about stones? Anybody have an idea? Do you guys know what the word says about stones? Rocks. Something about being quiet? David and Goliath. Yeah, but that's, that's going to be another story. <laughs> Today, what we're going to do is we're going to bring out, we're going to bring out the verse that says, give me one second for my reference. Luke 1940. It's Jesus who's speaking. You guys can actually just kind of face everybody. That way you don't got the backs to them. Luke 19.40 says, If the rocks, if my people, it's Jesus speaking, if my people will not speak up and cry out, the rocks will, right? The rocks. Does this live and breathe? Does this move and jump around by itself? Are you sure this doesn't breathe? It can't say hi, hello, happy Sabbath? Okay, all right, 
quickly, you guys, take those stones that you guys, boys got in your hands, walk around and give everybody a stone. As soon as you have a stone in your hand, raise it up. Go quick. We don't want to take too much time. We're in training. When you're in training, you, you work hard, you work fast. Go, go. There you go. Pass them out. Pass them out. You guys, take, take those these guys in the center here. As soon, yep, soon as you got your rock, grab it. There we go. All right. It's okay. <laughs> we'll give you one. Here. Give me yours. I'll take the pecan. That was mine. All right. So these are your reminders to take home with you. If I do not cry out as a disciple, as a disciple in training for God, if I do not open my mouth, this rock is going to cry out because God says it will. Do you believe God? You believe God says? You, think about that. This thing can't breathe. It's hard. But God said it will cry out if you do not. Okay, guys, did everybody get a rock? Everybody got a stone? All right, bring that back up here. Come here, you guys, real quick. Hold on to them. You're going to keep these. <laughs> Look at that. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. If you guys don't have a, have a stone yet, that's right. Get these guys up here. You guys, you all got your own? You got one? You got one? Okay, go ahead. Grab one from the bowl real quick. We're going to actually pray. All right. Everybody's got one. Okay, you guys stand right here beside me. Let's face everybody out here. Amen. I'm glad you guys were here today at least. Pathfinder's having tons of fun. Well, we had fun too. Amen. All right, everybody close your eyes, please, and join us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, that it's living and it's breathing. We thank you for the rocks that don't live and breathe by themselves, but you will make them breathe if you need to. But, Father, we know you don't want that to happen. So, Father, instill your spirit in us through all our learning of the word. As we study and train every day, Lord, may we become disciples looking to become ambassadors for you with every breath we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all speak up for the Lord. Amen. Uh, scripture for today is Exodus 5, 2. And um, in the reading, it says, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know, Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Amen. All is right with the world. I got my pet rock. And don't cry out when I'm speaking, please. <laughs> Let's have a quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank thee so much once again for being able to be into your sanctuary today with a God who loves us with all of his heart, his being. The God who gave us his only son to die for us. We can never praise you and thank you enough. Once again, we call upon the Holy Spirit and the holy angels to walk these aisles, Father, that we may all receive a blessing. These things we pray and ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm happy to see my Bible. This morning it disappeared for a while. 
And I don't know where we found it at, but uh, praise the Lord that we did uh, get it back. Because I'm getting old and I need a few notes here and there like everybody else. So. He was infatuated with a lady in his classroom. She was beautiful. And this occupied his mind the whole time that he was in class. And he was really smitten. So he, he went and he prayed to the Lord. And he said, Father... I want this girl. I want her to be my wife forever and ever. So he prayed continually about it. And no matter how hard he prayed, the answer did not come. She wouldn't even give him a second look, let alone the time of the day. And he struggled with this. He was heartbroken. So once again, he began to pray and pray hard, agonizing, grieving with the Lord, saying, please, please, please. Nothing happened. They got down to the last week of where they're going to have prayer. And not a, nothing happened. He got angry with the Lord. He said, Lord, I can't believe you let me down. So they graduated. Life went on. And then lo and behold, ten years later, he received something in the mail. And it was an invitation to go to their 10th year anniversary from school. So, of course, he was so excited about it, he RSVP'd very, very quickly back to saying, I'm going to be there. I'll be there with bells on. He was so excited to see if this young lady had gotten married or whether she had any children or whatever. Finally, the big day came around. He went in that evening and he registered and he walked into the room and looked over at all his uh, fellow students, but he did not see her anywhere. He was dismayed, so he went on back and went over to the registration desk and he said, did so-and-so register? Oh, yeah, she registered and she's by herself. Ooh, she's by herself. He just got so excited. So he went back in and he kept looking around, looking around. He didn't see her anywhere. So finally, he asked one of the students there. And the student says, well, she's sitting right over there in, in the corner. He looked, he said, no, that's not her. So he went and he spoke with another person. And they looked back and said, that's her. And no, that's not her. He was just so devastated. It can't be her. This girl that I remember was beautiful. This girl is cosmetically challenged. She is not pretty. Something happened. And she's three times the size that she was when we were in college. Can't be. But anyhow, <clears throat> he finally sank in that it was this individual. So he goes outside, takes a deep breath. And he said, thank you, God, that my will was not your will. Because if my will would have held up, I would have been stuck with this young lady. So we all have our wills. So he was extremely thankful to God. We know in Jeremiah 29, 11, it talks about, I know the plans that I have for you. Sometimes we don't know what God's plan is. You know, we can ask and ask. I know that my son used to walk around the house saying, I don't know what God's will is for me. And he kept praying about it and, and praying about it. And when I was on, down at Vanderbilt on Monday picking up, uh, well, taking my niece down for uh, her follow-up appointment, I was visiting with some people, and the chairs were set up at Vanderbilt in that particular room where they're back-to-back, -back, and then they're set up along the walls. And so as I was sitting there chatting with other people, not trying to be annoying, but, you know, I like to engage people in conversation, and uh, I heard this sweet little baby cry. So I turned around in my seat, and I looked, and it was such a beautiful, beautiful child. Everybody thinks their child is beautiful, but, you know, this one, this one was. And I can tell by the appearance of her hus the, the husband there that he was military. He had that type of haircut. And so I engaged him in conversation. The little girl was three months old. He had just gotten back from Afghanistan, I think, you know, maybe five or six months prior to that. 
and he introduced me to his wife, and I chatted with her uh, a little bit. She was there. She had an irregular heartbeat, so that's why they were there, you know, to get checked out. So I went ahead, turned back around, and started talking with the people uh, across from me. Eventually, I could feel the chair move, and I knew that they were getting up. There was always nurses coming out, calling different names, you know, left and right, but evidently their name was called. And I could feel the chairs moving once again. So I was sitting in a position where I could see a whole lot of things. I could see people coming, I could see people going, uh, so on and so forth. So I happened to look over they were, as they were going out, and this particular gentleman, good looking as he was, was a double amputee. Both of his legs. Both of the legs were gone. And I thought to myself, wow, whose will was this? I'm confused. It's distraught sometimes. We don't know why things happen the way that they do. We know that we have the power of choice. We have a will. God has a will. But, you know, we don't always know. And I thought to myself, what? What if I never read the Bible? What if somebody didn't come and witness to me about the Bible? I would never know what God's will uh, is for my life. I know in our generation, which is eons ago, uh, Basically, you know, you went to school, if you survived childhood, and you got up to where, you know, you were in high school or college, whatever, that uh, you wanted to do the best that you possibly could. And you wanted to get a job, the best paying job, and you wanted to get married eventually. You wanted to work your way up. You wanted to have children. All these things, you know, were, were kind of resonant uh, on, the, on the plate for each and every one of us. And then them silly yearbooks <clears throat> that everybody, you know, is supposed to sign. Some people sign, some people don't. They write the same things that they wrote in somebody else's book. And I'm, you know, some of the rich kids, well, <laughs> I'm going to be a doctor and I'm going to be a lawyer and uh, I'm going to be a teacher. But there was an old saying, you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an Indian chief. Most of us just put down the Indian chief because we didn't know what we wanted to do. <laughs> we had no idea. So anyhow, <clears throat> we find out that uh, the battle of the wills. We didn't know what God wanted. We didn't know what God's will was. But you know, when you start reading the Bible, <clears throat> the first thing that you actually see in the Bible is uh, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had a free will. God said, guess what? This is all for you. You can have everything that's in the garden. It's your choice. Well, I got this one special tree over here. Don't touch and don't eat. So unfortunately, <clears throat> Eve wandered away from Adam's side, and there's a lot of debate about that. But So it was her will to take a, a little walk over there, even though she wasn't supposed to. And after a while, the devil was able to entice her into touching and doing all them other things, eating the fruit, whatever. And so she exercised her will, but she exercised her will in the wrong direction. Pretty much in the wrong direction. And Adam had loved her so much that when she came, Adam, Adam, look what I've got here, this wonderful fruit. Adam was upset, where did you get the fruit? Well, I got it from the tree where the serpent was talking to me. Adam could have said no, but Adam didn't. Adam exercised his will because he loved his wife more than he loved God. Elder Hoare did a presentation this morning on Cain and Abel. Very, very good presentation. Both had wills. Both had, you know, decisions to make. They had, you know, freedom. So we find that when God had required them to bring in a sacrifice, he had given them rules and regulations and said that I want you to bring in, you know, a lamb, the best lamb that you have, and make a sacrifice. Well, Abel did what he was required to do. It was his will to be in tune with God's will. Cain, on the other hand, brought vegetables. I mean, we're, most of us are pretty much vegetarians here, but we're familiar with the vegetables. But that was not what God required. God said, I wanted you to bring a lamb, and I wanted you to slay that. I said nothing about vegetables. So he had a will 
And they decided, well, you know what? I'm not happy with his decision. And I'm going to do what I want to do. And we know eventually that Cain rose up against his brother Abel, who was a follower of God. And he smoked and he killed him. That was his will. It was not God's will. It wasn't uh, Abel's <laughs> will to be dead, but the wicked one had taken over. The battle of the wills. We had our scripture reading this morning about Pharaoh. I remember doing sermons on him in the past. So he says, when Moses had entered in, and he made the request, you know, to let the people go. Pharaoh says, hey, <laughs> I'm a god myself, and I've got 1,500 gods here in Egypt. I don't know your god. I don't want to know your god. The only thing I want to know is for you to get out of here and not come back. I'm not going to serve your god. And if you look over in Exodus 4.21, which is pretty close to 5-2 there. And probably just move it over a bit. And he said in Exodus 4:21, And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that you do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. And I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. See, we have a God that knows everything about us. He knows our uh, rising up. Our goings down, where we go, what we do. We don't breathe without him being right there and knowing everything. He even knows the hairs on our head. And he's been trying to catch up to me because mine just keeps sounding like disappearing here. So I'm sure he's got somebody full time on that. But he knew his character. He knew Pharaoh's character. He's a very stubborn individual. He didn't need no God. He didn't need anybody. He was Pharaoh. He was the king. So it wasn't very, very hard for God to be able to come in and to harden his heart. You come in with one of the, uh, temp not temptations, but, <coughs> but uh, the falling away of the uh, first plague. And in that first plague, Pharaoh says, well, I, got, I got gods that can take care of that. But the gods did not take care of that. And his heart was hardened. And then when he came back with another one, his heart was even further hardened. So his will was, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And that's it. So every time something came, he said, I'm not going to do it. So eventually we know what happened to Pharaoh also. You know, you can just push against God for so long. And then eventually, God's not going to put up with you anymore. He's going to leave you to your own devices. And this is what happened to Pharaoh. He ended up in tough water, I guess you could say, in a roundabout way. Jonah. God says, Jonah, I got a special thing for you to do. I want you to go to Nineveh. And while you're in Nineveh, I want you to preach to these people. And I want you to preach that if they turn their ways from wickedness and come to worship me and repent, then I will spare the city. But Jonah knew in his heart of hearts that God was not going to destroy that city. So he decided he wasn't going to listen to God. I'm going to do my own will. I'm going to go down here and jump on a cruise ship. And I'm going to get as far away as I can from this area. And, of course, we know that he went overboard, and he was swallowed by a, a big fish, and then he was regurgitated up on the shore. And suddenly, his will became the same as God's will. The battle of the minds, the battle of the, the wills. Nebuchadnezzar, very important in our prophecies. He was a very, very extreme, harsh man, not easy to deal with. But God knew that he could use him. He could force him with his will. He had told the people, you know, your unfaithfulness is really getting to me. I want every one of you 
to turn about from your wicked ways. And if you do, like we've talked about through the history when you left Egypt, don't harden your hearts. Come back to me and I will spare. And of course, they didn't listen. So he used Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar went down and he destroyed the city, took the best crop of the people, took them back to uh, Never Never Land there with him. And he took uh, all the uh, people that were intelligent, smart, maybe not necessarily good looking, but uh, he wanted the cream of the crop. So he had Daniel and he had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Daniel, he was just brilliant. And of course, we all know the story. They didn't want to eat the king's meat or drink his wine or run around with the ladies. You know, they just went ahead and did what they wanted to do. And they became extremely, extremely important. And God blessed them in a very, very dramatic way. And so we find that God used his will to use Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar could do the job for him. And then God opened up another door when he came back. And they had very, very important positions. But the main thing is that we have the Babylonian exile, which means that God is using this to do his will through history. So now we have the prophetic book of Daniel. And the prophetic book of Daniel ran all the way down, you know, to the 2300 days, 1844, so on and so forth. So he was able to use that. So we not only got Daniel, but we also got the book of prophecy of what God wanted to do. He used his will on Nebuchadnezzar. And eventually, after Nebuchadnezzar went on that diet for seven years, uh, just eating grass, that uh, he decided that, you know, God's way was the best way. And so they say we'll see him in heaven. I guess, uh, <laughs> I guess we will, according to what everybody says. You know, and, and then when I thought about this, I thought to myself, was God working his way in my life even before I knew what his will was for me? I know many times, uh, not many times, but a few times I've shared uh, uh, my rough life and how many times the devil could have taken my life, which would have been seven times. I say this reverently, very, very reverently. God was talking to the hand, but Irvin wasn't listening. And my lovely bride was with me on one of those excursions at 70 miles an hour through the median with rocks and trees and whatever else, but God did uh, spare me. And what rejoicing there was not only in the family but in heaven that the bad boy had actually come and accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior. Praise be the Lord. God is patient, probably more patient than he really, really should be uh, with us all. Who is the man in the Bible that is best known because he had a talking donkey? Balaam, yeah. We had donkeys out back when we were running a house while ours was being built. My wife could get him to talk. She would go out with stuff there, you know, and she would say, you know, come on, come on, come on over here, but you got to sing, you know, and they'd, and they'd make those kind of crazy noises. <laughs> and it was just so funny. But uh, she eventually trained me too, but I didn't make that kind of noise. But <laughs> You know, many of us pray long and earnestly, asking God to show us his will, God. But you know what? He knows our heart. He knows everything about us. And he knows whether we are sincere or whether we are just seeking his stamp of approval on our choice. The really only way to understand God's will is to have no will of your own. I thought I had a free choice. What are you talking about? To have no will. It doesn't mean you have no preference. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had a preference. And if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But if not, thy will be done. Thy will. You do your thing. I will do what you want me to do. So he was willing to have no will and no comment uh, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane as far as trusting fully in his father. 
Saul. Everybody was upset, especially Samuel, when they heard that they wanted a king. So they ended up getting Saul. They made Saul the king. But Saul had a will and a mind of his own. When he was going to go to battle, God told him, you know, you need to wait. Let Samuel come, and when Samuel comes, he will do the sacrifice, and this will assure your victory. Well, I don't know where he's at, but I'm getting really tired of waiting. So Saul takes off and goes to war. He was also told and requested by God that when you do go, you kill everything. You don't bring anything back. Unfortunately, he came back, and I remember Samuel saying, what is that bleeding of sheep that I hear in my ears? You weren't supposed to bring anything back. Saul just did anything that he wanted to do, and it really, really upset the Lord. He had his will, and God had his will. And finally, because he wasn't talking to God, I'm going to go to the witch of Endor, and I'm going to chat with her a little bit. Maybe she'll give me some real positive uh, information for my life. And, of course, we know how that, how that ended out, a disaster. Samson. You remember Samson, Robert? Yeah, he's a big guy, huh? You carry a gate all the way up a hill and put it up on top of the hill. That I'm not sure how many men it would take to carry that gate, but he was a very, very strong individual. And you know the Holy Spirit had to be uh, with him. God wanted him to marry an Israeli woman, but he was not interested. He had his own mind up. Hey, you know, I saw this lady, whew, Delilah. Mm. Nobody can compare with her. And no matter how hard his mother and father tried to beg him not to do that, he decided that he was going to use his own will. I'm going to do what I want to do. I am going to take her uh, for a wife. And we know what also happened to him because... He didn't do God's will. And then David, when he woke up from his nap and was walking on top of the temple, happened to look down, and here was another beautiful woman. He didn't say to God anything, because he knew that God would say no. So he used his own will. He found this beautiful woman, Bathsheba, just opened up a whole, whole can of worms with death and everything. It was really a shame. <coughs> So we know that each one of these men used their own will and not God's will. We have to be ever so close to God. There was an old song called Feelings. I remember Jerry probably remembers this one too. Nothing more than feelings. And it was quite an interesting uh, a song back then. But you know, feelings can be either good or they can be bad. You've got to be very, very careful. And if you're not really that close with God on a day-to-day -day relationship, when you come to that intersection, don't go by feelings. You can go left or you can go right. But make sure that you're so close to God that what you're feeling is what he actually wants you to do. And you go in that direction. Amen? So we have to have that relationship with God, total surrender. There was a man feeling one time that he wanted to know God's will and he said, I think I'm just going to go randomly and I'm going to go into the Bible and I'm going to turn the page without looking and I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to put it on a text. And when I read that text, God is going to show me what, what I should do. And so the first text that he picked was Matthew 27, verse 5. And it said, Judas went out and hanged himself. He said, well, <laughs> that doesn't sound right. So he went ahead and he took the thing and he opened up the Bible and he went and then he finally went and he pressed his finger on another one. And it said in Luke 10, 37, go and do you likewise. <laughs> Please. There's no way that God wants me to take my own life. There's got to be something hidden here. So he said, I'm going to go and do it the third time. So he went to the third time, and he went ahead, and he found a text, and he put his finger in there, and he went ahead and read it, and it was in John 13, verse 27. What you doest, do quickly. 
So, <laughs> so this, this ain't working out, so we're going to have to do something different uh, with this feeling stuff here. I'm not feeling the mojo anymore, that's for sure. A young pastor came in to his first district. Very nice-looking individual. And one of his churches had two ladies who were unmarried. And they were sisters. And they were still looking for a husband, even though they were later on in years. So the mothers, being as cunning as mothers can be, invited him over to come over to dinner. So the young pastor came over and he went to dinner and he was really, you know, excited. It was a wonderful meal. So the mother says, why don't you go in the parlor? That's an old term for the living room. Go in there and sit while we clean up. Well, he no sooner got back there and sat down a little bit. And lo and behold, one of the sisters came in. He said, boy, I've got some wonderful news for you. I got this feeling from God that shortly we're going to be married. And the pastor, <laughs> pastor looked at her and, wow, okay. He said, well, you know, when I get that same feeling that we should be married, then we'll get married. But until then, it's not going to happen. <laughs> feelings. You've got to be so careful about feelings. Open and closed doors. We talk about that a lot in our relationship with God, and we talk about it in Sabbath school and different prayers. Our God is a door specialist. He knows how to open and he knows how to close. And if he closes them, nobody can open them. And if he opens them, nobody can close it except him. The rolling, revolving doors. On Noah's Ark, the Lord closed that door and nobody was going to open that door. Unfortunately, everybody outside was lost. And I did a sermon two years ago, and I interjected part of, of Noah there, and I was concerned about the number of people that had passed away. And when I did the research, the lowest number I could find was 800,000, and the highest number I could find was 2.5 million. So I took it upon myself, and I thought, well, you know, let's just kind of logic this thing out, took an algorithm, seen actually how long they lived, at what point in time they would have their first child, what point in time they would stop having children, how many children they had, and then I did the same algorithm with that. So, But I came up with a million two, and that is a very conservative number for to get to Diluvian people. But it's just amazing to me that everybody had a free will back then, but here we have a million and two people that didn't want to do what God wanted them to do. There was only eight people left that actually, you know, loved the Lord, and they survived it. You know, we talk a lot about today, yeah, well, I can't wait to get to heaven. Well, maybe we're not going to get to heaven. I pray about it a lot because there's some things in my life that I struggle with every once in a while, like probably like everybody else does. And uh, it seems like you overcome just about everything. You think, yeah, I'm there, man. You know, I'm there. And then all of a sudden, you know, you lose your temper or, Something else, you know, that happens in uh, your life, and you say, <laughs> is there no end to this, God? Please, you got to get me someplace where I feel comfortable with you coming to take me home. Very, very tough part to be into. Abraham wanted a child very, very badly. God came to him three times, actually. He said, you know what, you're going to have an heir, your people are going to be like the sands of the sea. There's going to be so many of them, you, know, you just can't believe it. So nothing happened, and nothing continued to happen. And then his wife said, you know what, you're getting older. Maybe you should take my handmaiden and marry her, and then that way you'll have a child. And we had, he had that child. God came back and said, I'm going to have to open up another door because you closed the other one there, and I'm very, very unhappy about what transpired. So lo and behold, he had another child. And these two children over in the Middle East, their families are like the Hatfields and McCoys. They're still going at it today. So much death and destruction, it does not make any sense. Day after day, bombings and killings of innocent people. So he misunderstood the timeline. You know, sometimes we pray to God and said, you know, I need this to happen right away. 
Well, our God is an 11th hour God. If you don't know that by now, <laughs> you're uh, not doing the correct prayers or not approaching it in the correct way. Sometimes he does answer very, very quickly, and sometimes he doesn't. Jacob knew that the birthright was promised to him. But he couldn't wait for God's will to kick in, so he decided, oh, you know, me and mom are going to take it in our own hands. So they tricked the old man. He got the birthright. But then it was 30 years later before he was able actually to use that birthright because of all the trouble they had between him and his brother. Good old Moses, we can never talk about him enough. And I've done a lot of research outside of that, but I'm not even going to talk about that. But Moses was very, very important in Egypt. He fought a lot of battles, which people don't know about and whatnot. But God came to him. He says, you know, this is my will. This is what I want you to do. I want you to take the Egyptians, put them aside, and bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Okay. So... He didn't waste any time. The door was open. He just ran out and killed an Egyptian. and He had to take off, so that door got closed. Forty years, he wandered in the wilderness like the Israelites did when they, before they got to the Promised Land. Forty years. Tending sheep. So God did open it, the door up again for him and said, this is what I want you to do. And Now that you're listening and you're not doing your own will and you're willing to do my will, now we can get down to business and get the ball rolling. And poor Joseph, <laughs> if there ever was a poster child for opening and closing and doors, it would have been Joseph. It's just one thing after another. He's in, he's out, he's in, he's out, he's in, he's out. But he goes from a slave to number two in all of Egypt. But God had really, really uh, blessed him. So the only way that you're ever going to get to the place where you're ever going to find out about really what God's will is in your life is to have no will once again of your own. Having no will of your own means an ongoing daily relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Only his power can get you to this point. So my prayer is this morning because this book right here is just full of things of open and closed doors of wills and battles of wills and uh, whatever else but we all need to know what our, what our wills are I still don't know what my will is but I guess you know that the Lord will keep on using me and until he gets me to go some other place or whatever the case may be I really don't, uh, don't know at this place we know that the 144,000 are going to be a blessed particular people. And there's a belief that if you're one of the 144,000, you may not stay in Murfreesboro. You may be transmitted or translated over to Arabia, but God will equip you. When you get there, you'll be able to speak Arabic and you'll be able to go through that message just like that, you know, to win souls. So we never know what God has in store for each and every one of us. I know that I'm always willing to do anything and everything that God requires me of me to do. Hence, I'm a nuisance when I go out to places like the hospital and talk to everybody. You get opportunities to witness and, you know, you, you just never, never know uh, about people. But anyhow, that's my prayer, that you will spend more time. There's times that I don't. I'll be very honest with you. I don't slip out of bed and right away, you know, I've got something to do that day or I've got too much to do and I, and, and I take off and my day does not work out like I wanted it to because I didn't invite Jesus to go along with me. So, uh, you know, my bad, my bad. And then sometimes I sleep out of bed and I have my prayers and I talk with Jesus about a number of different things and then when I get done, I say, okay, Lord, now you gotta help me up. <laughs> this old body is running out. So, but anyhow, my prayer is that you all will go ahead and seize that moment every day with Jesus. This world ain't worth nothing, that is for sure. And I will try to find our closing song here, if I can find my... Okay, the closing song is 567, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. 
And I heard a pastor one time say, we're going to sing our, our <laughs> Have Thine Own Way, Lord. It's a song that everybody sings, but nobody pays attention to. Have your own way, Lord. Shall we stand and sing and pay attention to <sighs> hymn number 567, Have Thine Own Way. regular potluck. I don't know if Jason's still here or not, but everybody's welcome to come over to the potluck. This is in, in back of the church today. I don't know what the menu is, so I can't help you out there. But uh, I know it'll be good. That's the main thing. Now let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, what a blessing it is to once again be in your house, Father, to receive the blessing that you wanted us to receive today. We pray, Father, that hearts have been touched, Lord, and that they will realize that how close they really, really need to be to you if they want to go to heaven. We don't want to be left outside the ark, Father. We want to be inside that ark, that safety spot, Lord, so that you can save us in spite of ourselves. For those of us who don't stay, Father, give us traveling mercies on the way home. May we have a blessed Sabbath and keep you first and uppermost in our minds that this is your day, the one day a week that you would have us to set ourselves apart to worship you. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>